And this story comes from Beckwith. And this story is about Uli. Now, Uli is a goddess about which, again, not an awful lot is known. She appears here and there. Uh, but she, what is known, and almost every time you read about her, she was a goddess of sorcery. Now, you've got to understand, for the missionaries, and lots of other people brought up with that kind of thinking, any kind of magic was sorcery, including healing. Uli was associated with healing. For those who wanted to do harmful sorcery, she was also called upon, but that doesn't mean she helped them, because she was called upon for healing, and she was called upon for manifesting, because she had these magical abilities. But almost everything you read says only, you know, a goddess of sorcery, and we get this connotation that she was uh, dark and evil. Well, dark she was, because that's what Uli means. It means dark. And with darkness in Hawaiian connotation, depending on the Hawaiian, why in one sense it means the inner unseen knowledge, the darkness of Po, of nighttime. And, but there are others who are afraid of darkness in any form and consider that evil and bad. Okay? So you've got both ways of thinking here. Okay? But Uli had, let's put it this way, Uli had her good side. And she uh, kind of represents human creativity, our ability to manifest things that have never been before. Um, and someone said, some writer said, that one man's magic is another man's technology. Uh, a little story in Africa, uh, when I was up in the northern part of a country called Togo, why I visited the house of a priest and he had invited women from a distant village uh, in and they were all sitting around on his living room floor. Uh, he didn't have any chairs and he would, he would often play host to visiting people. So uh, at one point in, while we were there, why he flipped on the light switch and the lights came on and the women had never seen lights before. Never seen electric lights. And they just, oh, wow. And he flipped them off. <laughs> wow. Do it again. Okay. Flipped it on. For them, that was magic. There was no known connection between the magical gesture that he was doing over here okay, and the production of light over here. So one person's magic is another person's technology. And so there's even a technology to Uli's magic. All you have to do is know how to apply it. Very simple. At any rate, this is Uli and one story about Uli. So we need for this one an Uli. Good. Uh, we're going to need, uh, actually the name, when I say dark, it can be any dark color. So dark green vegetation, the dark of the blue sea, any dark color, this is what Uli is. Um, I also need a man, Kana. Somebody want to play Kana? Come on, Kana. Good, you're a good Kana. Okay. Um, and I need a chief, Kapepe'e. Kapepe'e. The chief. Okay, you're going to be the chief? All right, good. All right. So we got a chief. And I need a Hina. Going to be the Hina? Okay, good. All right. So, this story, some of the names, first of all. Uli, as I said, means any dark color. Kana is a word that means without limit. And you'll discover why in a moment. Uh, and we talk about the uh, chief. Kapepe'e means the deformed one. Oh, I'm going to need one other. Um, Ha'upu has to play a hill. You want to be the hill? Okay, good. In a second. Okay, good. 
And uh, this one is a little difficult to translate effectively. So we won't even translate that one. But, um, and do we need anybody else? Okay, that's good. All right, in this story, first of all, let's get Uli up here. And Uli's color is purple. Okay. Now, in this story, it's a story about Uli, but there's an association with some other things that are going on. Because this story takes place on Big Island. And in this area, Kana is born. First, in the form of a rope. Now, you know that already that he's a kupua. He's a shaman, because Maui was born in the form of a rope, too. And other kinds of heroes and demigods and shamans have been born in the form of a rope. It's kind of like a sign that they've got special powers. So he's born in the form of a rope, and his parents don't want him. So Uli, it was the grandmother, comes over and gets Kana and takes him to her home over here. Okay? And as, they, as, they grow, as he grows up, they discover that Kana has some strange and wonderful powers. He is, and, and you find several of these kinds of stories in Hawaiian mythology, he is what is called a stretching Kupua. He has the ability to really stretch out, extend out his arms, and you know. I think we had a um, there's a movie recently and a cartoon set called The Fantastic Four. In one of them is a, a can they stretch their arms out all over the place? Uh, I think in The Incredibles, the mother was able to do that kind of a thing, and I don't know if anybody remembers. <laughs> This is, a, this is only for those ancient elders among us. Does anybody remember Rubber Man? <laughs> yeah, you remember him. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so anyway, he's a stretching kapua, you know. So that's very handy when Uli says, Oh, Kana, will you get me that coconut? Sure. Okay. Doesn't have to climb the tree. That can be very good, you know. Uh, go, go bring the canoe up on the beach, boom, boom, you know, without moving. Lots and lots of benefits to a stretching kapua. Okay. So now, um, Hina, who didn't really want to have anything to do with him, is still his mother. Okay? And he cares about her, and she's grown to see some of the benefits of a stretching kapua, too. So they, 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 they go. As he gets older, however, because he stretches and can become so big, they have to make the house bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> till it finally stretches all the way down from up from the mountains all the way down to the ocean is the house that has to hold Kana in it. Right? So, meanwhile... There's a Molokai chief, Kapepe'e, who has heard of the beauty of Hina. Now, he really has a stool. This is the reason why, yeah. He has a very strong desire. He said Ha'upu was difficult to, to translate because it means strong desire. So what he does is he has a magical hill. Come on, so the magical hill, he sails over to Hilo Bay, which is right here. Come on. Okay, you're on top of... Okay, so stand behind her. Okay. And you actually decide to hide. Okay, so you get back there, you're hiding, and you're the hill. Just kind of do hill like this. There you go, that's, that's good. Okay. Now, this hill has landed on a little island in the middle of Hilo Bay, and Hina is very interested in this. So Hina comes over, and she decides to climb the hill. <laughs> and she's looking around at all of this, and meanwhile, Uli and Kana are doing their thing, and he's helping to gather the, the, uh, 
the food stuffs and he's helping to to find whatever needs to be found and just seeing how far he can stretch and they keep adding on to the house. Uh, <laughs> but what happens here is Hina then, and once she's on top of the hill, then the chief Kapepe'e leaps up, gives the orders to Ha'upu the hill and sails away with Hina. <laughs> he abducts her with Sails away, sails away, sails away with Hina. Okay, good. Now, change, change of venue. Now, you just stand sort of over there, okay? Now this, be, oh, don't go away. Don't go away. Except Kao, Kao Pei, maybe, maybe you can, okay, come, come. You're on Kao Pei Pei's island now, which is Molokai, right? All right. So now you're on Molokai, and Uli gives Kana a magical canoe that no one can destroy. She has to go to a special sacred place because this is not only a magical canoe, it's extremely ancient and it was buried in the ground. So she digs into the ground and she pulls out this magical canoe and she gives it to her grandson Kana and Kana goes after his mother. So Kana takes the canoe, and as he's sailing all the way over to Molokai, why Kaupe'e -pe 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 has all his warriors try to smash the canoe. And all the stones bounce right off it, and they bounce right off Kana, and nothing stops him until he finally gets over to here, and he's, and even though the warriors can't stray it. Now, what happens is, then Kaupe'e sends Ha'upu the hill to fight against Kana. <laughs> now here's what happens. This gets really interesting because Kana stretches in order to try and overcome the hill. The hill stretches <laughs> to overcome Kaupei and they both stretch and they're stretching and stretching all the way up into the sky and Uli sends a telepathic message all the way over to her grandson, and she tells him, ha, ha Upu is really a giant turtle, and his stretching power is in his flippers. <laughs> so, Kana stops stretching, reaches over, and breaks off the flippers. <gasps> then, Ha Upu loses all of his stretching power. And then Kana stretches all over and breaks up Hapu'u into all kinds of little pieces and throws them in the ocean. And then he grabs his mother and gets in the magical canoe and comes back to Uli who greets them in a loving way. Kapepe'e is completely despondent and goes into hiding and no one ever sees him again. Okay? <laughs> No one ever sees him again. <laughs> but what happened to ha, ha Upu? All those pieces became all the turtles that we find in the Hawaiian Islands today. Okay? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So these are the stories of the goddesses. In telling the stories, you can see where some of the ideas about them come from. They come, and we've only told you a few of the legends just to kind of give you a taste of it. You can see that they were talked about in ways that where they were personified as human, which is often done so that people can relate to them better. Uh, they all were given whatever magical qualities were appropriate to them, and yet there were always the concepts of the elements that they represented as well. Okay. So I hope this gives you a little bit better understanding of Hawaii, the goddesses of Hawaii, the people who live here and did live here and made these stories possible. Thank you for listening. Mahalo. Mahalo.